Sunlight bakes the clearing. The air teems with dust, hanging lazy in the air. Undead stand in a wide circle around the excavation, hooting and calling at random. Over a hundred of the things, of all sizes and shapes, they trot about, lethargic. Malaika is his prey. He will attack anything that approaches her. The hunger of the beasts is quickly doused by their yearning to survive. One creature lurks slightly behind the larger male, its gaze fixed upon the young woman. Hunger draws it in. Temptation looms large in the beast's mind. It sees an opening and pounces. Buso meets this challenge with all the ferocity of the wild. Teeth tear into the attacker's cheek. Hands rip at the dead skin. Strands of foul meat peel from bone, revealing a rotten core. The attacker fights. It wriggles, working its way closer to Malaika. Muso pulls lumps from it. Still, the thing manages to move. It kicks at the former guard with enough force to part them. Quickly it turns and jumps onto its meal, biting, trying to find a soft spot, pulling at her clothes with all the malice it can produce. Malaika wakes, pain surges. At first it seems distant, merely the crescendo of a bad dream, but now it's real immediate. She cannot scream, the veil of unconsciousness still over her mind. Her eyes open, pupils shrink. The little scene is quickly brought to an end. Musso pulls the attacker from the young woman. He jumps on it. The neck and jaw crumble under the force of Musso's punishment. The crowding undead scatter, fearful of his dominance. Finally, the guard bites into its throat. He shakes his head violently until the spine gives way. Tendons snap, sinew frays, releasing the head from its mooring. Malaika sees none of this. She crawls to the safety of a tree. Its knotted roots form a cocoon. She forces her way in. Then Muso is upon her. Now she can scream. She kicks out like the fallen attacker, but the former guard refuses to engage with her. It sits, calm, body returning to normal after the exertion. Slaughter can be very tiring, especially when the only weapon at hand is a foot. Viscera drips from his chin. All around, yet at a distance, the undead react to this event. Nothing can exhilarate these fiends like the sight and smell of death. A higher plateau of pleasure can only be reached by becoming the death dealer. Having intimate knowledge of another being's interiors thrills them. The sense that a life is slipping through their fingers. The very scent on the air. The bouquet of destruction. Sickly and sweet at once. With a hint of iron or some such metal. It's intoxicating. They look over at the strange couple, prisoner and warder. The young woman rises from her place amongst the roots to meet their gaze. She is trapped, her only hope being the large beast that guards her. He starts to pace as she steps from the tree. Injury slows her movement, but she moves anyway, walking towards the brightly lit clearing. Sunlight warms her skin. The guard rushes up to the closest creatures and forces them away. Only a few remain. They circle an area, defending it with much valor. Malaika hobbles a few feet closer to the group. She can see that they protect a person. Only the legs are able to be viewed, but the flesh is clean and taut, unlike that of the beasts. Her guard chatters at these defenders. They submit to his will, backing away from their prize. The old woman comes into view. She is guarded by the undead, 
a prisoner of the walking rotten. The body lies in an unnatural pose, its head turned away, waist and rib cage at disparate angles, legs and arms bending in odd directions. Malika hurries over. Musso trots around her like a hunting dog. She kneels at the witch's side. She weeps, bringing both hands up to cover her mouth. The injuries become apparent. Blood stains the earth under the woman. She rests in a puddle of her own fluid. The young woman reaches out. She pulls the body closer, correcting its posture as best she can. As she brings the head back into alignment with the rest of the body, shock grips her. There is no animation to the witch, which makes her darting alert eyes even more alarming. The vessel is broken, but the spirit is strong. Malika feels them burn. She sees the red marks like tiny wounds on her iris. What happened to you? She says with broken voice. Oh, my girl, don't cry for me. How can I help? What should I do? Ah, no one can help me. I am lost. Malika tears some fabric from her sleeve and dabs it on the old woman. Here, I can clean these, these cuts. You look like her. It's the eyes. Yes, it's all in the eyes. The old woman coughs between words. Tiny droplets of pink phlegm dapple her cheeks. Like who? She was a beauty, and nothing would stop your father from getting her. He was truly a great hunter, if nothing else. Stop talking. You didn't know my father. You're just tired. Your mind is failing you. Keep this on the cut. Malika presses the wound. The woman flinches. Ah! Get off me, girl! Leave the damned cuts alone. My blood will spill. These beasts will eat me, and all will be as it was. I won't let you die. The young woman attempts to help again. You do not have the acumen. You cannot save me from death. Take your hands away. Stop touching me. Then die, you... you witch. Malika slumps next to the elder, throwing her hands up in dismay. I will. You have only ever wished pain and hardship on my people. Why even try to care for a witch? Witch, witch, witch. You have no concept of my abilities. Have you spoken with the gods? Have you heard their tales? Never. My people serve me like a queen. You cry and act like your father, wasting your life believing what your parents told you. Don't talk about my father. Malika wails. I will speak of whoever I wish. My brother was tiresome, always whining, always acting up to the crowd. He never changed. Your brother? The words force all the air from her lungs. Mouth hangs open, aghast. Yes, my brother. That makes me your only living relative. What a joke. Ah, I said stop! Tell me, Malika says with a curious tone, what do you know of snakes? They eat and they shit. What else do you want to know? A snake killed my father. It was unknown to me, black and orange like the fire beetle. Did you use your dark arts to kill my father? The young woman lowers her hands onto the witch's cuts. A finger finds the loose flesh of a wound over her collarbone. 
Malika forces her filthy digit into the laceration. Ah! Stop! Don't! Tell me which. No! Ah, stop! I'll make your last hours an eternity of pain. I use no snake! I use no snake! Ha! Malika shouts in triumph. But you did seek to take his life. Please! Stop! Tell me! He needed to feel my angst! The witch screams. Why was he allowed to rule in heaven while I was forced to serve in hell? What do you speak of? I took the power back. He could never deny me that. The mighty chief was a failure. He knew not the nature of our faith. He was the shaman chief, the gods' ears and eyes on earth. He spoke their words. He watched over their lands. No, no, no. Mother taught me the ways of the earth and sky. Your father learned what we wanted him to learn. The basics. There is more to our faith than mere rituals and storytelling. The basics. Malika mumbles in disbelief. He was no storyteller. A sad, sad day when the master of your life is seen for his human frailties. But then, you didn't really believe that he was holy, did you? He was good, Malika starts. He lied to you and your people. He had all the non-believers cast out into exile, and then he took power for himself. Are these the actions of a good man? He was kind, she tries again. Stop this woeful crying, girl. Save your stamina, for you will need it to survive this day. I fear that the light of life is to be extinguished. You may be the only soul available to do my work. I would never help you. So you will let the world burn because of your own poor temperament. You made it burn. You destroyed our land. You brought the beasts here. Now that your body is broken, you wish me to facilitate your redemption. You must, spits the old woman. The time is nearly past. The sun and the moon both play in the sky. Now is the time. We must work together to undo what I have done. I could help if... Wait... What is it you have done? Asks Malika. I drew from the power of the earth. The power that resides deep below. The spirit spoke to me. It was angered. The white men have harmed it. They ruined our peaceful land. Your father performed rituals to appease the gods, but never did he praise the earth spirit. Not until it was too late. I don't understand. I challenged the spirit. I asked it to cleanse the land. I asked it for help. And in return I offered it your people. The witch trails off. Silence hangs between them. The elster closes her eyes and smiles. You have ended us all. What must I do? T to appease it, to calm the earth spirit. I have told you. Find someone of pure blood. Let it feed the earth. Call the name of the spirit. Atta o Kolo Inana. Call the names of the high gods. Let them see that he has been fed. That is what they desire. I could not before. I cannot now. There must be some alternative to this barbarism. It's fantasy. Like some story we tell children you can't expect me to. Shut up! What you have seen proves that our predicament is quite real. The rivers run with poison. 
It kills our crops and stains our clothes. Trees fall, fire rains, and the call of the beast is heard throughout the day. Find the one with pure blood and perform the ritual. He is nearer than you know. There is no such person. Everyone is dead. Both of our villages are deserted. There is one. I saw it in the mind of a beast. That one there. She motions towards Muso. The boy is our saviour. What boy? What village is he from? No, no. He is white. The small one that accompanied you to my village. You know? Ezra. Malika mouths. The young woman searches her mind for signs of his purity. He was quiet, respectful. He hadn't made any effort to invade her sanctity, unlike the men of her village. The little fellow certainly seemed to be ignorant of the ways of the world. He may well be pure. Questions and queries run through her mind until a shocking sound pulls her back into the moment. From over her shoulder, the sound of stone cracking can be heard. The ground shakes slightly. Off in the excavation, the visitor from the sky has finished its task. The hole has become deep. Its mission is successful. Now only a hard layer of stone is left. The xenomorph hammers it with its makeshift hands. The rock breaks, sending the creature down into the darkness that lies beneath. Quickly, you have no time. Find the boy. Do what needs to be done. The witch yells as Malika charges off, Muso trailing close behind. Long white tables run up the edges of the canteen. Small circular seats attach along the sides. The room rests in a warm orange light that filters in through the glass wall. It leaves large square shadows on the parquet floor. Although one shadow is unlike the others, it's shaped like a spider's web. The glass above it is shattered. Metal crashes against the tiles of the serving hatch. Then silence. A man walks out from the kitchen area into the canteen, chest bared. He swigs from a glass decanter letting the fluid run lavishly over his chin and neck. The vessel empties, to his disgust, forcing the man to launch it across the room. Who drinks wine in the jungle? You take whiskey to the jungle. Everyone knows that. He turns to look at his mess. Someone had better get in here and clean up this glass. You people treat your guests like animals. Worst holiday I've been on in years. A squeal followed by a loud clicking sound echoes around the long room. The captain hobbles to the corridor, making sure not to step on any of the glass. The speakers dotted throughout the compound sing and whine, chirping like birds then plunging into silence. Wait! The man holds his trousers up as he runs, saving the empty building from seeing his undesirables. Another loud squeal pierces this quiet place. It stops suddenly, then a type of static, like the sound of an untuned radio pierces the air. Captain Ike! A voice booms from the speaker system. Sir, do you receive Captain Ike? The captain sprints along the hallway leading to the main stairs. He jumps down the steps when he reaches them and finds himself in the glass atrium. At the desk, he pulls at the radio's receiver. It was lying near the speaker system's microphone. The sound of static dies down. I'm here, I receive, I receive. Captain blurts into the mic. Sir, I'm happy to hear from you. Look, I, I can't talk. I must be quick. Something is happening here. 
these government guys came in and took over. They won't tell us what's going on. And they threatened us. They told us not to talk. But I couldn't just leave you, sir, so I, I stole the files. I've been reading through them, trying to find out what's making them act this way, sir. There's something there. Man, you have some damn nerve. What do you want me to do now, huh? Uh, run with the bulls? Jump over a volcano, what? Sir, I had no control over that. They forced us out of the comms room. I shouldn't even be talking to you now. Sir, you have to leave. Get out. If they can't recover the data, they're going to destroy it. The crackling voice cuts out. Shouting can be heard from the radio. Angry words shouted in the background. The sound of panicked movement, then a muffled yell. Sir, they're coming. Arm yourself. Get out right now. A gunshot rings out. The radio crackles. Then a cacophony of gunfire jumps out from the speaker. The signal dies. Shit. Really? Captain slurs. No more static leaves the radio. Silence fills the atrium. An increasingly sober captain drums his fingers on the wide desktop. He swears under his breath. Within minutes the man is fully clothed. He searches the building in typical military fashion. Methodical yet aggressive. Weapons and ammo. Through the offices, the garages, the warehouses and loading bays. Everything opened up and examined. Boxes emptied. His combat bag grows into an unwieldy sack. It's almost full when he sees an item that makes him smile. He drops the bag and his new rifle. Danger. Explosives. Only for use by NEA qualified professionals. Two pallets of blasting jelly with eight cases on each. The whole lot strafed with danger logos. Metal clips are unfastened. The sweet smell of high explosive fills the room. The odour even more pungent than the oil and petrol of the garages. Captain takes a deep lung full of it, snorting it through his nose. Then he recoils as the fumes muddy his already addled mind. The bag is now over-encumbered. Zipper nowhere near closed. This doesn't dampen his conquistador spirit. He takes anything shiny, anything that looks important. In one of the garages he spots a quad bike. He starts strapping the bag on its rack, not wanting to lose any of his bounty. As he mounts it, he realises there are no keys. Off he walks to scour the area. There are sets of keys about, but none fit the dirty ATV. There is, however, a bottle of liquor. Into the next garage he goes, striding about. The search annoys him. He has no time for it. The only vehicle other than the quad is a yellow motorbike, the kind with knobbly tyres and a bare chain. Nowhere for him to fit his bag, though. He approaches it and sees instantly that the keys are in the ignition. The combat bag is retrieved. Some of the more mediocre items are left on the workbench. Captain finds it difficult to leave behind any of his treasures. The choice between gold trinkets and ammunition is a daunting one. He finally decides to dump everything except the bullets, explosives, and a small pouch of gold nuggets that he had taken from a display case. The bag is closed and slung across his back. The rifle is loaded and slung across his front. The bike is taken between his thighs and kicked into life. A clear road lays ahead of him. Before he leaves, he pauses to drink the last of the brown liquor, casting the empty bottle away. The machine winds and pulls away into the car park. Spinning wheels spray dust and pebbles into the air. The front of the bike rears up like a wild horse, tipping the man off the back and winding away into the cars coming to rest on its side. Captain respects the thing now. 
he fears it too. Feeding the throttle in as smooth as he can manage with trembling hands, he rolls past the lumbering wrecks, past the bullet-riddled bodies of his comrades, towards the havoc of the jungle. <laughs>